Welcome, Martin Mormonjika. Thank you so much for making time to talk to me today. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm so glad to be here. And it's lovely to see you in these moments of isolation. When you see friends pop up on your screen, it just puts a, a spring in your step. So it's good to be here. Thank you so much. So I'm interviewing you, Martin, for, as you know, the Future Social Service Institute newsletter. Like everybody, we've been adapting in these times and we've been doing a vlog series for our newsletter. Martin, you've been the Vice Chancellor at RMIT since 2015. When in the year did you start? I started right at the beginning of the year. In fact, uh, I was meant to start uh, just after Australia Day, and I think I snuck in a week early because I was so impatient to to get going. So it was right at the beginning of the year. Yeah, I'm not surprised to hear about that. And prior to that, you came here from the UK where you were the Vice Chancellor at the Open University, which is the UK's largest academic Mm. institution. And you drove some incredible um, transformation there in terms of the online platform um, and the use of that. Uh, And there have been an absolute global leader in that space. You came to that role having had a range of really impressive executive leadership role. Was that mostly in the US, those roles? Yes, mostly in the US. Yep. So general manager at Microsoft of Microsoft's worldwide education portfolio and a range of other um, senior executive roles. My first question after what I was saying before with you was, what was your first job, Martin? Great question. Well, I, I was one of those kids in my generation. I actually had my first job when I was in grade three with a paper round in the shopping yeah. centre where my mum had a shop. And then I went on and uh, helped the milkman deliver milk when I was in my early high school. But the first real job I had when I was at university as a summer job was actually driving the blue train at SeaWorld in Queensland. And I can still recite the script all the way around the park if anybody's interested <laughs> one day. You never forget those things, do you? No. Do you know, do you know what, well, and while we're at it, that, that fabulous shot you've got behind you, my first real job was at RMIT. I, when mm. I was a student, I worked in the student union. So in that building up behind you holds a very special place for me oh, too. Oh, that's wonderful. That's terrific. So, Martin, there's a very strong thread through your career in terms of harnessing the power of technology to enable people who would otherwise not have access to education um, to gain access. And you've driven innovation in that in that space across three continents. Can you talk, given all of the incredible unprecedented um, change and transformation that is occurring now because of the restrictions that are being posed because of COVID, how, how you see that um, what's coming down the track in terms of of adaptation in learning and skills development for us, particularly in the social service sector. Yeah, and, you know, as I was thinking about the social services sector and, you know, what this sort of digital way of working that we've now been getting used to for the last few months might might mean, I, I wanted to just draw on some of the lessons that I've personally curated over the years as I've worked at that intersection between education and and technology. And so it doesn't really matter whether it's a teaching environment or whether it's a a meeting environment or a coaching environment or a leadership environment. The end of the day, it's human beings working together using technology. So I think some of these thoughts probably will ring true for all of those watching, depending upon the environment that they're in. The first is just um, for us all to be aware of, I think, that we're heading into a chapter in our lives now where there's going to be an intense focus on jobs and the skills required to perform them. And even before COVID, a lot of the literature was shifting to the fact that, you know, we're all going to have to get used to having between five and 15 careers in our lives and constantly learning for life. 30 years ago, when I got started, we talk about lifelong learning and it was sort of like, yeah, OK, OK. But now it's sort of that that imperative. And so creating lifelong learning models, ways of people to being able to flexibly come back and top up their skills to be relevant in the environment they're in is both um, an imperative for the individual, but increasingly for the sector and for the various actors in the sector, whether they're government, not for profit or for profit. It's how we harmonise to work together to make sure that we have the appropriate um, staff with the appropriate skills constantly refreshed 
to do the best possible job we can for our communities. And I think technology, play, as we're experiencing, clearly has a role to play in, in how we do that. I think it's also important that we reimagine credentials uh, in the, the social sector, you know, have the courage to think about the fact that it can't all be about the traditional credentials of the degree or the certificates or the diplomas. We've got to start thinking about some of these lighter weight, more flexible micro credentials they often get described that come with it, digital badges that can be searchable inside um, various um, sort of repositories like LinkedIn or Facebook or Seek or wherever, so that actually demand and supply can find each other and people can actually do shorter, sharper learning interventions, but get a credential at the end that we all understand what that means. And I think that's something we need to be thinking about um, as well. And, and I guess all of that means that flexibility moving forward in the way we think about learning and interacting with each other is going to be incredibly important. It's not that there will ever be a substitute for face-to-face -face where it's possible, but I think it'd be fair to say that certainly in the short term, but I think increasingly in the medium term, we have to use all of the tools that are available to us to help support and develop people. Uh, and that means I believe technology as it's been growing in its popularity will continue to be seen as a normal way we go about doing that. But as I said before, uh, I would encourage everybody watching this to not really think it's got to be all e-learning or it's got to be all face-to-face, -face, but really come at it from a blended approach and simply use the best tools available uh, to, 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 to do what we need to do to be successful. I often talk about in my speeches that for my whole career pretty well, I've been sort of answering questions about, well, is digital learning better than face-to-face? -face? Yes. And, and, you know, the way I usually answer that is there's great teaching online and there's lousy teaching online. There's great teaching face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. and there's lousy teaching face-to-face. -face. The goal just should be great teaching and using whatever tools we have at our disposal and whatever adversity we might be living through like COVID right now to use the best tools available to get the job done and help enrich and develop our people. So I hope, does that sort of make sense? Absolutely, Martin, that completely makes sense. And it really resonates with what we're hearing from some of the students who are part of the pilots that, that Fizzy has been helping set up. That which really leads into the other thing that I wanted yeah. to explore with you, which is around that issue around student experience. Yep. You've absolutely consistently talk about student experience at the centre. How do we ensure a good student experience? What, what are your views about what are the elements of a transformative learning experience for a person? Yeah, and I'm really lucky, Michaela, because my undergrad degree was actually in adult education. So one of the ah, one of the rare yeah. creatures running uh, sort of a university now that actually my discipline was adult ed. And I often reflect back on how much of what I learned back, in, you know, a long time ago, back in the 80s and 90s, sort of um, rings true. It just rings true in digital ways. So here are my headlines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so number one is I think it's really important that we let the learner have a say. Uh, in the in the construction of their learning. In many ways, in my mind, it helps establish the why for the learner. Uh, when I was going through my degree, I actually contracted with my lecturers as to what I would uh, apply the theory to. And by being allowed to actually reach agreement about what I was going to be studying, it suddenly became really clear to me why it mattered. The minute I discovered why it mattered, then boy, oh boy, suddenly the deep learning connected with me and I started doing very well. So that whole idea of breaking away from didactic, I'm just here to tell you what you need to know, mm -hmm. to really involving the learner in the construction and the why of what they're doing is absolutely essential. Um, the second one that uh, I believe deeply in is an intense focus on the real world and building real world competencies. I think we live in a world now where there's so much information that we have to stop thinking about it being around the transference of information and instead focus on meaningful knowledge. And meaningful knowledge for most of the students that I work with comes best when it's applied 
and when it's applied in a way that they can see the connection to the real world. So really focused on competency-based education to real world examples where people can apply directly, no matter what their background is or their current level of experience, you can always find a way for a learner to connect the learning to, in an applied competencies-based context. Um, the, the third, which is just becoming so, so important now in, in the world of work, is a combination of the hard skills, the technical skills, the knowledge with what some people call the soft skills. And there's nothing soft about them as far as I'm no. concerned because no. I've learned they're the toughest ones to develop. So I like to call them human skills. But the really best programs now are the ones that recognize that it's a blend of cultivating the technical competencies and the human competencies that go with them and then being able to evidence through example that people have mastered both the human and the technical competencies is just so very important. And in the social services sector, it's clear to everybody watching this vlog that that is just critical. You can be an absolute genius with the knowledge and have no ability to connect with people or show empathy with people or communicate with people or problem yeah. solve with people. And you will just be you'll be um, a fraction um, of value compared to getting the balance between those things. Um, the next one, which I've already talked a little bit about, is don't get hung up on on the mode. Don't get hung up on, I've got to do this through technology or I've got to do this face-to-face. -face. Focus on the instructional design. Focus on what it is you need to achieve. There's a lot of literature now about what they call the, the flipped classroom, which is sort of taking everything that we used to do in the classroom with information regurgitation and move that online, get them to do that mm. before they show up. So all that valuable time that is then in the classroom can be used to debate, to apply, to challenge, to group work, to, to problem solve. And I think there's something really in that. So it's, it's using the technology and the face-to-face -face in a blended way where you take the best attributes of, of both um, would be another one of mine. Um, and then a, a huge one for me, before I'm done as an educator, I'm going to break the back of this, but fit for purpose assessment. Um, yeah. You know, we've got, you know, people will typically race forward to say, how am I going to be assessed on this? And then they will filter their learning based on the assessment. So if you get stuck in a sort of an exam based, true, false, multiple choice, sort of um, essay driven type world, instead of competency based assessment, then you will starve the learner of the opportunity to really develop the deep learning and master the ability to apply what they've learned. So, so competency-based assessment for me is everything, uh, and that can be done in a variety of ways. But if anybody watching this thinks that sort of rote memorization and regurgitation exams have any place in the world we live in, when we virtually have the sum of all human knowledge on a smartphone in our pocket, is sadly, sadly mistaken. And then the final one is sort of um, what I call the, the magic triangle of learning, which is really terrific content and instructional design, great teaching, and then pastoral care or student support. It's making sure that there's that support wrapper because life often gets in the way and it can be hard for busy people, particularly working adults or carers or others to move through a structured education program. And we often miss the last one. We often miss the fact that sometime all people need is a little bit of care and encouragement to keep going. And that yeah. can make a huge difference to them in their ability to learn. So there you go. Those are my sort of some of my secret ingredients for you. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing, Martin. I, I, I could. I've got a million questions about each of those, but I think that's really incredibly important framework. I'm really, your last point about um, caring for people and being aware of the, we've, we've been doing a lot of thinking about that at the Institute at Fizzy about how do we make sure we're opening the door to people who wouldn't necessarily think they're going to survive at a university and how do we keep them there? And I think there's a lot of really good activity going on there. It sure is. And it can be quite simple, Michaela. When I was at the Open University in the UK, so 280,000 students, all working adults, many of whom had, had no experience of higher education. And we found just simply a, a, an outbound phone call 
to one of our students that we could see was struggling to just reassure them that they were not alone, that there were thousands of other students that were struggling as well, that it was perfectly normal and the university's job was to help them succeed. Just that phone call often made all the difference in the world to keep somebody believing that they could make it. Yeah. It does. It, well, we've all had the moments where we've had those kind of get people reach out to us like that and you know how much it means. Yeah. Martin, on that note, we're at the end of Reconciliation Week um, and I've witnessed what I have found your absolutely inspiring leadership and very genuine engagement with the reconciliation process at RMIT. So I really... I really want to thank you for that. I feel very proud to work for an institution that takes reconciliation so seriously and is it at the heart of what we do. Given it's Marbo Day, um, which is such an historic kind of moment. Sorry about that. That's Alfie, by the way, everybody, if you heard him bark, and we're going to do our best to uh, stop that in a moment. But keep going, Michaela. That's okay. Everyone's got children and animals and and life happening around them more than we're used to. Marbo, 1992, such a historic moment um, for Australia and pausing and and marking that. um, And I've been really relished and, and heartened by what's been able to be done at RMIT about that. We're watching what's going on in the US at the moment and it is confronting, distressing, um, enraging and a lot of a, a lot of it kind of sometimes the response is that it's over there. But we're very aware and the theme um, of Reconciliation Week this year is around in it, in it together and thinking about what's happening here in Australia and reconciliation and what more we can do about that. I'm really curious about your thoughts at this very important time about that. Yeah, no, thank you. And it, um, it of course, breaks my heart to see what's going on in the United States right now, given that um, I lived there for over 15 years mm. and all my daughters were born in the United States and, and are American citizens. But sort of coming coming back home, um, when I was I was away from Australia for well over 20 years, and when I came back, I suddenly realised that I was a stranger in my own land, because so much had changed in the reconciliation journey while I'd been away. Um, still nowhere near enough, but a lot had changed. And and it, what's interesting is my commitment to reconciliation was to begin with born out of a place of fear, Michaela. I I didn't understand. I didn't know what these new rituals of acknowledgement and welcome to country were. I didn't know what I should say, what I shouldn't say, but I had this deep burning commitment now that I was home to rediscover Australia and more importantly, to rediscover the tens of thousands of years of rich cultural history of our First Nations peoples and, and and leading RMIT an institution that was deeply grounded in inclusion and access to do all I could to contribute and to the to the journey of reconciliation for us all to be enriched as as a part of that. So we began this process, Bungie Geary, which is around a shared future, which is it's reciprocity. It's that we have so much to learn from and be enriched by our First Nations peoples that the place to start should be there. It should be us as non-Indigenous Australians really taking the time to understand the real history and richness of that culture and and of the land on which we walk um, and, and, and take all of that value into our lives and that, that sense of then being in it together as Australians, First Nations peoples and non-Indigenous people, but do that deeply grounded in a sense of reciprocity, of respect, of mutual understanding, of carving out a shared future together that's what I discovered, and and I was led on that discovery through some by some unbelievable indigenous people who day one in the university, uh, um, you know, ran the most incredible welcome to country for me, 
and relaxed me and reassured me that if I had an open mind, an open heart, and a genuine desire for reconciliation, that they would walk with me and help me understand and enrich my life. And that's exactly what they've done. And I'm proud to say we now are enriching thousands and thousands of lives of our staff, of our students, as we walk alongside our First Nations peoples. But we do that first and foremost with a deep desire to celebrate everything that they have contributed to being Australia for being Australian for tens of thousands of years. And that's that's sort of my my story. And I do think that notion of being in this together with all that we're going through in being so separated both uh, in Australia and around the world is is another wonderful example of how much we can learn from the traditional owners and custodians of our lands as we create the new world we're going to have to go into now, Michaela. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but that's, uh, that's exactly what fuels me. Uh, and in this being Reconciliation Week, my leadership team and I, um, we've done a lot of exploring this over this week about our connection to country, what it does to ground us and enrich us, but also how thankful we are that we are in this together with uh, our, our First Nations peoples. Martin, that's that's a very, um, very genuine and heartfelt answer. And there's a strong thread through all that you've said today about being in this together and genuinely sitting with students, the first people of this nation, staff and um, a and in terms of the thread through that thinking about the social service sector so thank you very much you're very for welcome today. it's been such a pleasure take Thanks care everybody that.